Hello, everyone. Welcome. Just waiting a couple of minutes for participants to join. It takes a little, a little while, but I see names come like some of the names. Thank you for joining us today for our final day of the symposium. Gonna wait like a one more minute or so, and then we'll take it from there. Hello, I'm back. Um, what a great day to have internet problems at home. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> well, um, sorry, apologies for that. Um, I had just started talking, so let's start with the official remarks. Hopefully more people had the opportunity to join in the meantime. Um, good afternoon and welcome all to the final day of the 20th National Mural Symposium presented by Mural Roots. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Marta Keller Hernandez, and I am the Managing Director at Mirror Woods. As in previous uh, days, it is truly a pleasure to be here with you today. The National Mural Symposium is a professional development and networking event for mural artists, administrators, and mural producers to teach, learn, share, and explore current trends and challenges in the field of mural art. This National Mural Symposium would not be possible without the generous support of our community partners, Neighborhood Arts Network, uh, NYYC Artists Outlet, Sponsors Street Art Toronto, STS Canada and RBC, Mural Roots members, and all of you program participants. I would also like to thank our funders, the Toronto Arts Council and Ontario Arts Council. We are thrilled to host this panel discussion titled Disability Justice and Mural Arts, Building Pathways to Access. It brings together professional artists, arts researcher, researchers, and arts administrators from within MAD, CRIP, and disabled communities to discuss how legacies of ableism and colonialism have shaped present day realities regarding access, inclusion, and opportunity for artists with disabilities. Dr Drawing on personal and professional expertise, panelists will offer insight on the lack of disabled artists represented in mural arts fields and possible solutions for a way forward rooted in disability justice. I would like to thank Wai Jung Po uh, for leading the development of this panel discussion and also for moderating it. And a thank you goes out to the panelists as well for their continuous support. Uh, generosity and patience while this session was being developed. Wai Jun Ko is a queer, chronically ill, multidisciplinary artist. Their body of work spans mosaic, poetry, sound, movement, performance, video, and installation. 
grounded in a disability justice framework centering accessibility, community, and interdependence, their artistic practices interwoven with personal narratives of grief, care, and intimacy. YJ is the Associate Artistic Director at Redefine Arts, established as Red Dress Productions in 2005, a performing member of Raging Asian Women Taiko Drummers, the inaugural winner of an JRG grant for artists with disabilities in 2018, and an ILGBT artist residency alum. Before I pass the mic on to YJ, uh, who will introduce today's panelists and is gonna be doing a bit of like a land, knowledge, a land acknowledgement as well. I just have a couple of housekeeping uh, announcements. The webinar is being recorded for archival purposes and shared through digital platforms. Uh, live captioning is being provided by Patty Deshan from National Captioning Canada. So feel free to turn the live captions on as needed. Um, in terms of safety, if for whatever reason this event is compromised by someone sharing hateful or violent videos or audio, the webinar will be ended by staff and follow-up information about rescheduling, if relevant, will be sent via email. In terms of support, uh, St. Jackie Santos Membership and Technical Coordinator and our webinar host, uh, message on the chat if you need tech support during the event. Uh, Janine Beatty, Program Manager at Neural Roots, is moderating the Zoom chat today, so feel free to say hi as well. And if you have any questions throughout the conversation, you can send them through the Q&A feature. We will have some time around um, 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, to, to answer them. The Q&A feature can be found along the bottom of the app, like right next to the chat feature. It's quite difficult for us to track the questions on the chat, so we truly appreciate if you add uh, the question in the Q&A feature. And without further ado, YJ is all, is all yours. Thanks, Marta. Um, hi, everyone. I'm super honored and excited to be here. Um, uh, as Marta said, my name is YJ. Um, and as the moderator of tonight's panel, I want to welcome you all to this virtual space, which I and the panelists are all tuning into, uh, mostly from Treaty 13 territory in Toronto. Um, which is a traditional territory of many nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and the current treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Um, as a starting place for today's panel, I want to invite us all to take a moment to consider what care and accountability can look like in our processes as artists and muralists, particularly those of us who are settlers creating what is often permanent site-specific art, that ultimately marks into histories of place, ultimately makes marks into histories of place. Um, I invite us to ask, how can we embed our responsibilities as treaty people into the landscape changing work that we are doing on colonized land? Um, and how can we be more intentional about the stories that we are writing and unwriting into the histories of these lands? Uh, with that, I'm very pleased to welcome panelists, Danielle Hyde, Bushra Junaid and Carla Rice, who might be able to offer some insight into these big questions as we discuss over the next 90 minutes how legacies of ableism and colonialism have shaped present day realities regarding access, inclusion, and opportunity for artists with disabilities. Uh, so next, I would just love for uh, the artists to maybe introduce themselves and locate themselves um, uh, where, they, where they find themselves in in relation to mural arts and disability justice and um, whoever wants to go first, take it away. Should I nominate someone to go first? Carla. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you for the invitation to be here today. I feel honored um, to be speaking with Bushra and Danielle. Um, uh, on these issues. Um, and I'm just gonna situate myself a bit. Uh, I am a professor at the University of Guelph. I run a center called the Revision Center for Art and Social Justice. And um, in that role, I uh, co-direct a grant called Bodies in Translation which is a large scale seven year grant that I co-direct with Eliza Chandler, who some folks might know. Um, and on that grant, we cultivate um, deaf, uh, disability, mad, aging, and fat activist arts. And we study the effects of doing this 
cultivating work, the effects on audiences, the effects on artists, and the effects on art ecologies in Canada. And to kind of position myself in relationship to disability, um, I've long identified as living with mental difference, um, having had um, bruising and harmful interactions with psychiatry um, and being labeled and rejecting those labels. Um, but that kind of information and knowledge I kept hidden until joining um, disability art making and storytelling communities where I started to claim disability and kind of come out. Um, but I position myself in relationship to disability in this kind of liminal space or in a space somewhere inside and outside of the category of disability. And the reason why I do this personally is because while I carry um, non-normativities and I um, have the experience of misfitting within normative culture, I also um, don't experience the same kind of barriers to participation in, in cultural and social life as some of my colleagues and friends do. Um, and I, I live with what I would call an episodic disability, which is a disability that um, rears itself sometimes and um, leads me to step away from social and cultural life for periods when I'm feeling peri uh, experiencing periods of illness, um, but allowing me to step into social and cul cultural life when I'm, when I'm feeling well. Um, so it's kind of a fluctuating experience for me. And to position myself in relationship to the colonial order of things, um, I'm a white settler. Uh, I have Italian and Scottish roots uh, and grew up on uh, Mi'kma'ki, which is Mi'kmaq territory in um, what today is called Nova Scotia. Um, and I have an extended family of indigenous kin. And I wanna just call out my, and um, call in or just acknowledge and honor my Lenape and Potawatomi family in which I, I married, into which I married, uh, who teach me um, on a daily basis how colonialism has shaped my subjectivity all the way down. And to end um, my introduction, I also want to acknowledge this piece of um, digital art, which is a digital mural created by a local uh, Guelph nonprofit organization, an art making organization called Art Not Shame. And it's, this is a collective effort that was created through COVID and it's called Art Making and Hard Times. And you can find out more about it um, in, I think it's in the link that is in the chat. So thank you so much. I'm passing it over to, I'm going to pass it over to Danielle. Thanks, Carla. Um, Annie Bojo, hello. Uh, my name is Danielle. Uh, my spirit name is Gentle Wind Woman. Um, and, uh, Ojibwe, Garden River First Nations, born and raised in Toronto. Um, and my mother is uh, Italian and Ukrainian, also born and raised in, in Toronto. Um, yeah, so just before I get into anything, I just wanted to say, like, um, uh, you know, it's, it's really challenging, you know, having these discussions where we can't really meet in person or we can't even see the faces of the people we're with. Um, so just, you know, uh, positioning myself in this digital prescriptive space, um, going to do the best that I can. Um, and just wanted to come from a place of, of gratitude um, because this is all about access. And so this should be healing if, if nothing else. <laughs> um, um, but I just wanted to take some time to acknowledge uh, all the work that has come before, um, before I speak about how I've experienced things and where I'm coming from, um, because so much has gone on before and all the research thoughts, uh, lives, creations and curations that have gone on, the meaning making, everything, like all the various roads that sort of have led to this discussion and to today and all the wonderful people who I am currently sharing my screen with right now, who I'm so grateful to be with and grateful to be with the, uh, you, Marta, uh, thankful for mural roots and street art. Um, just wanted to put that out there and thank you to everybody who's here today. Um, 
it's been a challenging couple of years for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, injustice isn't new to, isn't new. It didn't come from COVID. So, um, just wanted to take some time to, um, let you know that you're, you're witnessed and you're heard and you're here and, um, just really, really grateful, um, for everybody who could make it here today and who couldn't be here today. So thank you. Um, so yeah, um, I'm I'm an artist. I'm an indigenous artist. Uh, I guess um, disability justice advocate as as well, um, and persons with a disability. Um, yeah, if I look over here, it's because my I have a giant screen over here, and my camera's over here. Um, but yeah, uh, my practice is best described as really multi multidisciplinary work, um, working between a lot of mediums, mural work, public performance. Uh, thought, photography, painting, um, you know, spoken word. Uh, and it's all work done sort of in collaboration. Uh, I'm not the sole owner of anything. I don't sell anything uh, of the of this work. It's all about acknowledging all the beings and forces seen and unseen that go into the collection of uh, and creation of the work. Um, and just acknowledging the physical realities involved, um, the ways that, you know, I can't be the sole ownership of, uh, have sole ownership over something uh, for various reasons, like, uh, you know, our eyes are, you know, we, our brains process everything slightly delayed into the past. So we're not really ever seeing anything in real time. So when I draw a line, there has to be other forces and, and actants involved in that. And so how can I, as an artist, uh, work to develop consent and come from a place of generosity and gratitude when I'm creating the artwork so that the artwork itself um, speaks and supports those conversations. Um, so really my work is is focused a lot on um, ethical relationality with the world around us, um, how we relate to the world, humanizing mental health and wellness and sort of revisiting, re-envisioning the language, um, some of the language that Carla mentioned, um, you know, in terms of removing some of that violence and 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 challenging how we are talking about mental well, like wellness and 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 health and well-being and really sort of dismantling those barriers between mind and body while we're also dismantling and challenging um the colonial narratives and power structures that uh make those sort of things uh seem like they're necessary um and sort of co-opt the fundamental generosity of art and wellness and really restrict things to a single narrative and the default narrative that sort of positions colonial power structures and westernized viewpoints at the center of conversations at the expense of other bodies and and, and voices um so just challenging that that presumptive uh posture of dominance and, and authority um that while not necessary is is still perpetuated and curated in a lot of ways by westernization of, of, of art and arts canon and, and uh, arts academia. Um, so really challenging that that co-option by colonialism and um, certain narratives and really trying to open up the, those, um, those conversations around power and place and meaning making. Um, because you know it, it's all too often very swift and bureaucratic and and, and quite harmful you know at, at best and at worst it really does lead to the erasure of, of people and the degradation degradation yeah degradation ooh degradation you know i haven't had any sleep right <laughs> of um of our environment and um it's it's just important that, that we're we're challenging that and we're holding those conversations and so i guess in terms of where i sit in terms of both the colonial narrative and within the narrative uh, my place with within disability justice it's very much the same place um they they kind of go hand in hand uh for me i find that in in challenging uh the meritocracies and in challenging the language and the violence and the erasure um there's that intersectionality that is always always at play and we are always being uh, made to believe that we are boxed and pulled apart into pieces and uh part of my work is sort of this remembering not just remembering the mind but also just like remembering of our parts and the ways that 
we again relate to the world around us and how do we do that ethically and how do we do those stories justice and how do we listen uh, in a way that is not extractive and take care of one another how do we reclaim that fundamental generosity of art that has been co-opted by colonization and instead um, reject using it as uh, as a way of repeating the violence that's been used against us and instead using it to rebuild community and rebuild each other and support each other in the work that we do. And uh, yeah, just really turning those tables and uh, you know, supporting everyone in, in community for sure. And I'm just going to pass it on, I think at that point, we'll probably get into lots of good stuff later. So Bushra, I'm putting it on you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, wow, those were incredible in introductions, uh, Carla and Danielle. Uh, hard acts to follow, but um, I'm Bush Richard I'm an artist and a curator and arts manager of Nigerian and Jamaican background. Um, the Yoruba people of Nigeria on my father's side and mixed primarily African ancestry on my mother's side. Um, I, I am told that my maternal forebear, uh, Sissa, uh, may, was brought forcibly brought from uh, West Africa to Jamaica in the hold of a slave ship as an adolescent. This is a perilous journey uh, called the Middle Passage. And all that really remains of her is her first name and, uh, or all that we know of her is her first name. And of course the, the culture and traditions that she carried with her and uh, the strength and resilience that she's passed down through the generations. Um, I grew up in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, which is the ancestral homeland of the, uh, the Beothic, who I learned in school or was told in school were uh, decimated by, um, by uh, European uh, settlement, settlement. And so um, my experience growing up in, in a space where um, I certainly was, uh, there were few, few black people, um, few racialized people um, where I was often uh, didn't have a sense or was told that I, I didn't belong um, has made me, uh, has given me a feeling of uh, precarity and uh, rootlessness and um, has had sort of impacts, long-term impacts on my uh, sense of self and sense of well-being. Um, I, I very much consider myself an unsettled person on a stolen and unceded land. And, and I do recognize the different but intersecting ways that colonialism has, has impacted uh, black and indigenous people and people of color. I recognize that our liberation struggles are intertwined and that fostering relationships of allyship, trust and mutual care amongst us can build, to build solidarity, equity, justice, and a sense of belonging for all. Um, I also am the outreach and development manager at the Ontario Arts Council. So my role is to try to support and connect with um, diverse communities and uh, bring pe people awareness about uh, the funding opportunities that are available. I, I run a couple of granting programs. Um, one is the Skills and Career Development Program, which supports Indigenous arts professionals and arts professionals of color to do um, professional development and uh, skill building. Uh, and as well, I, I, um, I run the OEC's uh, Deaf and Disability Arts Programs. And I, I'll, I'll probably contribute more about those uh, programs uh, as we as we talk, but uh, just to say that uh, there are, there are a couple of, of of granting opportunities, deaf and disability arts projects, which supports creation, production, and pro and professional development, and uh, and also a, a materials and supplies grant uh, that supports artists to uh, buy what they need to make work. So. Um, uh, it's really, I feel like I'm in a very privileged position to be uh, working at an arts council, to be helping to influence um, 
uh, policy and program uh, development, and um, to also be able to see the work of, of uh, disability identified artists, deaf artists, and uh, to you know have have the trust that they place place in me to help support the work that they do and want to hear and learn more about how to do uh, to support them better. So I think I'll leave it at leave it there for now. Thanks, Bushra. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, Carla. Um, those are wonderful introductions. Um, I find it like impossibly very terribly difficult to talk about myself and my work and introduce myself. So um, I just say thank you. Um, and let's jump in with our first question, if everyone's ready. Um, so I thought we would just sort of start um, by talking about kind of generally what are some some of the barriers that disabled people face while trying to pursue work, build community, access training, and thrive as artists. I guess, sir, I'll start off the conversation uh, with, I think that there is still a lot of stigma around um, what uh, different uh, able-bodied um, individuals are capable of doing. And that um, there's sort of this bizarre containment of, of disabled body and disability arts um, to the realm of art therapy and hobby which um, I think sort of uh, stems from, again, it's, it's that, that issue with sort of art canon and sort of how we're, how we're talking about art and relating to art and, and, and framing art that kind of plays into that in, in part. But yeah, it's, it's, it, it's almost like you have to work that much harder um, just to be acknowledged and, and recognized rather than having art being that, um, uh, that that space sort of where we can sort of have identities meet right and and actually treating identity and and differences and 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 similarities as 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 a meeting place where we can sort of come come together and just sort of have those conversations uh i just don't think that that is that that's quite there yet so i at least i have noticed that um if you're a disabled artist, um, there's a tendency to not uh, be willing to recognize or, or treat um, the work or the artists on the same level as those who are um, neurotypical or, or, or able-bodied. And Danielle, um... I'm just going to jump in. It's Carla speaking. And, you know, in in um, aligned with cultural practices, I'm just going to describe myself a little bit before I speak for people who are non visual or might not have the bandwidth and therefore can't have their cameras on. So I'm a middle aged white woman and I have blonde gray hair and I'm wearing a kind of gold top. Um, and, uh, you know, what Danielle said. Um, I've heard echoed in a lot of conversations with artists who are disability identified, mad identified, um, or, or deaf, um, as well as um, other non-normatively embodied or in-minded artists. So I would include in that aging artists. I would include also fat activist artists. So what brings all of these groups together in our view, um, in bodies in translation, in relationship to the bodies in translation work, is that all of these groups of people are imagined as non-vital and as, as being non-cultural producers. And we are trying to contest that with cultivating art by all of these groups, uh, art that um, proclaims um, the vitality of all of these communities. And, you know, in a study that we recently conducted in like 2019, just before COVID started and, and when the COVID crisis was happening, um, that we called Artistry Under the Table, we were actually looking at what artists, what barriers artists who are disability identified face in, um, in um, pursuing art as livelihood. And 
the artists identified a lot of the issues that Daniel talked about and they identified other issues as well. Um, one of the things that you know, I was really surprised with was within the first week of putting out the call for people to participate in the study, 70 people responded in one week. And we were surprised by that because of the risks involved in talking about um, how you make a living and a life uh, within um, kind of funding regimes that kind of constrain a lot what where you're allowed to get money from and how much money you're allowed to make. Um, you know, artists were taking a you know, taking risks really in talking in talking to us about what they were doing in order to support themselves um, to kind of survive and to support their art practice. Um, and it said something to me about how um, how much people needed and wanted to talk about the systemic barriers that they were facing in accessing art as a kind of life's work. Um, and out of the 70 people, we wanted to privilege BIPOC voices. Um, so folks who were at the intersections of um, indigeneity and disability or um, blackness and disability or um, being racialized and experiencing mind body difference. And we also wanted to open up the research to anybody who identified as living with a mind body difference and not necessarily folks who identified as disabled, understanding that that term comes with a lot of historical baggage and ongoing baggage that Danielle talked about. Um, you know, so folks describe themselves as neurodiverse, some people describe themselves as mad, other folks describe themselves as living their lives outside of what our society takes as a normal mind or a normal body. Um, conversations with folks, um, you know, focus on all kinds of barriers, um, especially experiences of applying for arts funding and disability income supports. And people talked about some of the creative ways they found around and through navigating some of these structures. Um, a majority of people um, said that they made a living outside of their arts practice. So mainly by dipping into precarious cash paying gigs. So some people talked about child minding, other folks talked about running errands, and some people talked about sex work as a way of supporting um, themselves and as a way of supporting their art practice. Um, people named access to affordable housing and access to art funding as two um, structural barriers that they face to pursuing um, artistic careers. And we can get into some of the details of that if people are interested. Um, uh, but people also named as another important barrier, um, kind of um, what we might call cultural obstacles or cultural barriers to accessing the arts as livelihood. And these included things like a lack of access to mentorship of more senior, disabled, mad, deaf, non-normative artists, which made it difficult for folks to imagine themselves into the role of a working artist. You know, so for example, you know, when I was, you know, in high school and when I was a young woman, I really wanted to pursue acting as profession, but I knew there was no way that I could do this as a large bodied woman. Like I could not figure out a pathway into the arts and being a performing artist and fat at the same time. So I abandoned that as a potential career. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, so how, you know, so not having those senior um, artists who are in sort of positions of power or visibility um, and in a mentorship position made it difficult for people to imagine themselves as a working artist or to find guidance in carving out a pathway for getting there. And this was especially marked um, in our discussions with um, Indigenous artists who live with mind-body difference, who talked about a, a, a lack of a larger community of practice with which to collaborate and consult. Um, and one interviewee actually told us how cuts to arts funds that are needed to build community um, meant that artists who are at this, these intersections, the intersection of indis, uh, indigeneity and mind-body difference, or um, 
uh, racial marginalization and mind-body difference um, needed to survive as, as she put it, lonely, solitary islands of art, which I thought was a beautiful language to use to describe this experience, the experience that I think Bushra is also alluding to. And um, this space, as many of us know, is, is a space that is really antithetical to indigenous cultural values and to indigenous life ways, which really privilege relationality and moving together. Um, so I'm gonna end, end there, um, but can deepen and talk more about various aspects of what I said as we, as we continue um, the conversation. And um, that was the end of my thought. So I, I'll just kind of pick up from, um, Carla has really touched on a lot of what I, uh, I would mention, and I put in the chat um, a link to a really good um, report that was prepared by Victoria Warner, um, uh, an artist uh, um, on behalf of Tangle Art and Disability, about many of the barriers that um, deaf artists, uh, mad, uh, disability identified artists um, uh, face in terms of accessing funding and other supports. and. Uh, really, really a, a, a great accessible um, read, but many of the things that they, she touches on and that I've, I've sort of gleaned are, you know, um, in engaging with artists is, you know, these, these attitudinal barriers and, you know, this, these perceptions that people have, have as Carla was saying about, um, you know, the nature of the work, uh, the, the, the quote unquote quality of the work, um, you know, just societal attitudes about uh, disability and disabled bodies and, and people's value and worth overall. Um, uh, barriers with respect to education and, and training. And so, uh, you know, there are some who, who, whose disability has limited their, their access to education and training. Um, you know, uh, barriers with respect to financial and funding access, um, accommodation of, of, uh, of uh, one's disability, um, you know, not having um, access to information about what opportunities there, that there, there are, um, and many uh, times uh, barriers that are, uh, or perceptions around things that have, um, that are real <laughs> or perceived or that have been addressed, you know, sort of those, those personal personal limits that, um, that come into play when, one, when somebody's been uh, disadvantaged. You know, many age-related barriers at both ends of the spectrum, whether you're, you know, um, aging out of the you know, child and youth system or whether you're uh, a, an older artist who, uh, middle-aged older senior artist who may be acquiring or developing disability with, with, with age and time or, or whose disability may be broadening, so or who you know might have dif difficulty um, with accessing technology, um, you know some of the, the barriers that people have faced in terms of um, uh, the pandemic, you know, and, and what that's how that's um, increased or amplified, uh, you know, at lack of access to technology, training how to use those technologies. Of all kinds of things. So I think I will, um, you know, a couple, may, maybe one other thing I would think about um, access to networks um, and community and opportunities to build those, um, those networks and uh, even identifying mentors and who, uh, who can support one in their growth. So those, those are some of the things that I'll touch on for now. Yeah, I just wanted to add to this. Uh, I, I also feel like there might be sort of this uh, prevailing assumption that there's no interest or a lack of interest in it as well. So there's sort of this invisibility that goes on um, around sort of dis disabled bodies um, and sort of uh, not recognizing, um, you know, just how much work has gone in. And like I mentioned earlier, all the work that has sort of been done leading up to this point. Um, and so there's this ongoing placement of, of all of this labor on, on um, differently abled people 
to sort of do all that self-advocacy work. And I don't know how other people feel, but I find myself personally like it's 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 easier to advocate for others than it is to advocate for yourself sometimes. I don't know if anybody else uh, ever shares that, but um, the 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 impact of that is is can't be understated um, because uh, imagination is is it's embodied. It's 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 in our physical being. And the way that our bodies are treated throughout our lives, the way that we experience um, that treatment, it impacts um, how we imagine things, how we imagine ourselves, how we imagine others, and how we imagine tomorrow and 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 um, you know f- futures. And so, when that labor is placed entirely on 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 those bodies, and there's no conversation being initiated. From elsewhere to invite and and to to open open that door and to hold that space for those conversations, um, it it really slows. It makes everything slow down to a grind to to a grinding halt, and um, it ends up ultimately perpetuating. I think a lot of those those harms and a lot of the barriers that have been uh, trust um, touched on, and I think that that really slows. Sort of, I, I feel like there's this idea that we are we're identified as producers and, and, and consumers all the time. And I'd like to see that shifted to creators and engagers um, instead of having holding human rights sort of hostage because you know you, your body or your mind is, is different, you know. Um, it's sort of using this sort of, oh, you're not producing or you're not consuming as sort of a, a means to justify spatial entitlement is um, needs to change. And so, yeah, just uh, definitely uh, a, a lack of initiated conversation. I think there's a lot of interest there, but I think the systems are can be overwhelming and people can, are already, as, as Carla and Bushra have mentioned, they're working so hard to keep their artistic practice going because it they have so many stories to share and so many experiences to share. And, and that's, that's really invaluable. And they're struggling. I just as an example, it really wasn't that long ago that um, that grants were considered a deductible from um, from your, if you were getting uh, social assistance. So I mean, in 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 no other situation, if you think about that, that's like um, you know you're trying, you're you're working, and that money is going towards a business. And that 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 money is being deducted from you. I mean, a grant is to pay for a project. Those funds are allocated. It's not your spending money. It's not your housing. It's not your food. And so to then deduct that from a person's living, like their social assistance, what they rely on to live and to feed themselves, it, it was always mind boggling. And it and it it really was only a few years ago that 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 was changed. And that was a. Uh, uh, a collective effort by a great number of people. Um, so just to show where, where where the logic you know has been and 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 where it still is in a lot of ways today, I think um, I think that's also contributing to a lot of the barriers. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, there's like a million things I could say about ODSP and how like. This, there's, there's like very little understanding for, I mean, A, like the experiences of disabled people, um, which is, doesn't really make sense, but, um, and also for people who are working as artists, um, trying to navigate that. Um, that could be a whole other panel uh, that I'm not gonna get into right now, but something that I heard a lot um, from all of you is really like, that these, like the systems that we're navigating as artists really like haven't been built with disabled communities and individuals in mind. And that's like, you know, education systems, funding systems, gallery systems. Um, And, you know, when the systems can't support us, I think that's when we turn to individuals. Um, And that looks like interdependent communities, um, peers, skill exchange and mentorship. Um, which is something that was mentioned a couple of times, um, which segues us into my next question, which is a bit of a biased question because, um, you know, I'm asking like, what what is or could be the role of mentorship um, as a learning pathway for disabled artists? Um, And I'm like, what, 
it, it is a really great pathway um, in, in my personal experience. So I'll just ask it, what is or could be the role of mentorship as a learning pathway for disabled artists to gain the skills, certification, and knowledge necessary to enter new artistic fields? Um, so maybe I'll take a crack of that one uh, first. Uh, I think it's, it presents a real opportunity for individuals to pursue informal avenues, right? That may be more self-directed um, to kind of determine what their own learning objectives and goals might be, um, you know, to kind of work at their, on their, at their own pace and schedule. Um, so I would say, you know, giving people opportunity to um, start with their, with, their, with their own agency and to, to pursue their own cur curiosities rather than, um, you know, associating themselves perhaps with, with one particular person. Perhaps they can work with a number of people to learn about different uh, styles or approaches or techniques. Um, you know, it, I think I'm, I'm really a big advocate of, of mentorship, um, you know, allowing people to work with somebody who's more established um, or, you know, whether that be an, a, an, another artist or somebody from any field or an elder who can share information or skills or different standards or knowledge or best practices that can help them to advance their career. Um, but I really feel like it, 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 it needs to be um, self-directed and with guidance. And um, there are a couple of, um, uh, I, I know that there are people tuning in from all over, but you know, in terms of for Ontario-based folks, um, there are a couple of funding opportunities that would su that support that. So uh, the Deaf and Disability Arts Projects Program, uh, for example, uh, it supports, uh, it does, it supports creation and production um, of new work, but it also supports uh, professional development through, whether that be just through study or training, so taking courses or workshops or master classes or do, you know, doing some self-directed learning or mentorship with, you know, as I said, with somebody uh, perhaps more established who's going to connect you to their networks. Um, it supports an internship or apprenticeship. So kind of hands-on learning, um, and it also supports the documentation of existing work. So, you know, that's something that we hear a lot of um, artists talk about, you know, not having, you know, access to opportunity to document their work um, in, uh, well so that they can use that then to get further opportunities. So um, I think it's a really, uh, mentorship is a really good alternative to um, to perhaps more for, formal uh, pathways. I'm going to just jump in here and build on a little bit, Bushrav, what what you're talking about by saying that in the artistry under the table research, you know, that the folks who we spoke with confirmed what disability artists have long, long expressed that deaf, disabled, and mad artists. And in that, in that, I would also include fat artists and aging artists. So I would insist on including other bodies of difference and minds of difference, needing interrelational and intergenerational communities of practice and mentorship opportunities in which to develop community, their professional practice. And I use interrelational inter um, intentionally because I think that um, just as um, older and more established folks have stuff to teach younger folks, I think that younger folks have stuff to teach older folks and more established folks as well um, so that it's an exchange in some ways and needs to be seen as reciprocal um, and approached as a kind of with reciprocity in mind. Um, and making these kind of spaces and making relationships that have potential for crip communities of practice to form has emerged in our research as critical to disability cultural reclamation, formation and flourishing, as well as to the claiming of disability or difference, mind-body difference as a kind of cultural identity. Um, and I would also say that these mentoring opportunities 
that can lead to communities of practice need to recognize that even claiming of disability itself is fraught within a deeply ableist as well as white supremacist settler colonial history and ongoing legacies. And this emerged as quite significant in a project that BIT um, co-developed um, and mounted in 2019 called Into the Light. And this project explored um, the impacts of kind of racist and ableist eugenic ideas in education over the 20th century. And in this project, we brought together a curatorial team of indigenous black and white allied artist scholars, both non-disabled and disabled, as well as survivor activists from different institutional settings in Ontario. And I wanna do a shout out to Yvonne, uh, Evadna Kelly, who led this project and um, did a magnificent job on it. Um, and um, the uh, survivor activists were from institutions like the Heronia Regional Center and the Oxford Regional Center, which institutionalized people with different kinds of disabilities, um, as well as um, the Mohawk Institute Residential School, which is often uh, called the mush hole for the poor quality of the food given to um, the children living there. Uh, and the Galt Training School for Girls. And from this research, what we learned was that disabled people and indigenous people have interconnected histories of institutional violence, of institutional abuse and trauma. And that governments, um, federal governments, provincial governments, um, settler governments over the 20th century have treated disabled bodies in similar ways as they have indigenous ones through confinement in residential schools in asylums in prisons and through elimination elimination through sterilization and through policies that were enforcing normalization so people to appear as or try to perform normal and through assimilating people into or attempts to assimilate people into a kind of dominant um, non-disabled, white, property, masculinist way of being. And these kinds of um, responses to Indigenous bodies and disabled bodies have had similarly devastating impacts for disabled and Indigenous lives. And I think of relevance to this discussion is significant um, in relationship to the intergenerational transfer of culture. And this really underscores in my mind the necessity of creating mentorship pathways, pathways that were intentionally severed by institutions and by the states for artists living with mind-body difference. And at this moment in time, I feel like there is a desperate need, an urgent need to recuperate histories of um, disability, to reclaim disability culture from before this eugenic period in our history and these ongoing and reverberating impacts of eugenic ways of thinking. Um, and that this is the necessary step in the reclamation and the cultivation of disability culture or cultures that welcome and, and center mind-body difference. So I, I'm gonna stop there again. Uh, I can talk more about this um, but um, just giving Danielle an opportunity to speak, uh, that was the end of my thought. So many like really critical things come to mind just listening to Bushra and Carla. Um, one thing is that um, for me, like public art, it, it lives in community. It is a convening of, of bodies and knowledges and stories. So really, um, all art is knowledge sharing, and particularly and especially so for public art. Um, so we're talking about um, this, this mentorship, but it, it's, it's not just a question of whether or not, you know, would mentorship be beneficial? It's, I think, in a lot of ways, I think it flows in the lifeblood of, of public art. And that it's 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 absolutely paramount. It's it's vital to public art being successful, and being uh, 
being and becoming and manifesting within communities. Um, yeah, it, that physicality, it, it's, it's just paramount. Um, and it really speaks to um, action. I mean, we, we you know, trying to, to support, um, we can talk about how we can support different able-bodied people, um, but really it's, it's acknowledging human as praxis and our ability to imagine together and work together and re-envision realities and ways that we can coexist without oppressions. And, um, and so mentorship, you know, it, it opens the door, it creates a space for that to happen, it facilitates that, it, it invites art in to hold those sort of com conversations, because all ultimately it comes down, like a big part of it is safety. Uh, you know, Carly was, it was touching on some of that violence, some of those negative experiences. Um, how do we how do we tackle those negative experiences? I mean, they have huge, they have intergenerational uh, effects. Um, and how might those those experiences um, sort of impact our expectations? Um, not just the expectations we have of others, but the expectations we feel safe to have for ourselves. And so I, I really feel like mentorship is 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 vital to all art in general as as part of that um, part of that knowledge sharing within within community and creating that that safety so that we can we can be free to sort of just uh, sit and realize uh, and, and let, just sort of let ourselves manifest what we, um, what, what we wanna create and, and what we want to, um, to see in the world. You know, a public art, it's not just about what we create today and there and it's, it's gone often, it's, it's there for, it's, it's in the memories of people for a lifetime because again, it gets to that engagement. It's very high, you know, there's a high engagement to public art. Um, you don't take it, but you don't take the wall home. You're uh, just the same way. You don't have to pick every flower to appreciate it. Um, it's it, like I said, it lives in that community, and so having mentorship there to have that safety, so that you can bring everyone together in those conversations. It's um, I can't imagine public art absent that. That doesn't seem functional to me. Um, so yeah, that's um, that's what comes to mind for me. Danielle, what I think what you were saying, like that mentorship is so vital and already like alive and interwoven into disability arts. And it, it's not like an if mentorship could be helpful. I think that's that's kind of what I was trying to say when I was saying that it's a it's kind of a biased question. It's more so that I think we already all knew what the answer was to that question. Okay. But I was interested in, in hearing you all talk about it, even though we already know it. <laughs> Um, I think we'll do one more question before we move on to a QA. and a um, And that's, it's something that I think I, I considered asking you, Bushra, to maybe elaborate a little bit on uh, funding and like uh, the disability, deaf and disability specific um, funding for artists um, in when we were talking uh, at the beginning about, um, about barriers for disabled artists. Uh, and so I'm wondering if we can talk about what what would be required of arts institutions and organizations uh, in order to create more accessible, welcoming and culturally relevant opportunities for disabled artists. Like what what needs to change? I think a lot of things uh, need to need to uh, change. I feel like there needs to be representation of deaf and disabled uh, people within these institutions, first of all, um, because that makes a difference for people to see themselves represented, to know that there's somebody who can identify with their experience and who can help to break down some of the, 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 the walls and barriers for them. Um, I think about, um, you know, and building mentorship into those processes uh, so that, you know, institutions are bringing, bringing folks in and helping to develop their capacity, um, you know, so that it's it's even happening at the whether it's at high school or uh, post secondary level, um, where you know breaking down some of the definitions that we have of if a professional artist or emerging artist, so that you know we give access to people who may be just starting out, uh, who maybe haven't had some of those opportunities, that kind of rethink some of those eligibility requirements that we offer many and more workshops that sort of demystify 
um, you know, the, the, the granting process, um, the peer assessment process. Um, you know, we think about the nuances, we think about the questions that we're asking artists and the expectations that we have of them. Um, you know, we offer uh, more opportunities for people to, uh, you know, apply in different ways, right? We, you know, all, all kinds of alternative uh, ways of applying, whether those be through video or whether they be, you know, there's so many different ways um, that the things that we could be doing better. And we, we do have a barrier re removals working group that we've established to try to kind of get, get at some of those things and, and, and improve some of those processes. Um, you know, to not make it so much of a labor for people who to access this funding and to be supported to do the, the work that they're doing it, you know, so that they're not, you know, set up to, to fail from the outset. Um, yeah, but, you know, um, even, even just small micro grants as well, like, you know, even small micro grants of $500 that allow people to make work accessibility funds that, you know, um, help somebody, uh, allow somebody to hire somebody to help them make an application or uh, project support funds so that if they're, an application is successful, they don't have to eat into the project support to pay for those accessibility costs, whether they be things like, you know, sign language interpretation or personal support or, you know, equipment rental or transportation or, all of these layers and layers and layers of support, uh, you know, supports for audience access, but also support for, for artists and lead artists on projects. So um, I guess I'll, I'll leave, it, <laughs> leave it there to give space for, for Carla and, uh, and Danielle to chime in, but, but those are some of the, or if you've got, you know, if you want me to expand further, I can, I can do so as well. Oh. Maybe jump in and, and just really support and build on what you said, Bushra, around shifting our approach to access. And Danielle, this um, kind of um, also speaks to a point that you made earlier from that of an individual burden to a collective or distributed responsibility. So what you were alluding to earlier is all the work that the individual artist or the engager has to do in order to access the art. Um, you know, if, if you're somebody with a disability, you might need to do a whole lot of work in order to figure out how you access a venue or a space, for example, if you want to engage with the work. Um, and that often is, you know, quite often is downloaded on the individual and that wears them out. It uses up your time and your energy such that you have nothing left in order to actually engage or in order to actually make and create. Um, so we have to be thinking about access as um, a systemic responsibility as opposed to an individual responsibility. I think that disabled artists have insight into the, the an ableist world, into how and in what ways the world is ableist. And, um, and also have a lot of knowledge about how to develop cultural practices that make space and make art accessible. Um, and those artists need to, their expertise needs to be tapped into in a more um, concerted way. I think we need to take the lead from disabled cultural makers uh, and creators uh, who not only can achieve accessibility in art spaces, but actually can support entire institutional transformation. And a large part of our work on BIT is focusing on how we make art spaces, how we make genres, how we make um, practices, you know, to use your term, Danielle, safer and more affirming. And um, on our website, we have a document called Vital Practices in the Arts. And you can look at that. It has a lot of ideas and a lot of tips um, for how you can make your offerings more accessible to more audiences. Um, but we also at BIT orient to access as iterative as continuously moving, evolving, expanding, and as innovating new ways of creating and participating in the arts. So one example of that might be to create a digital mural 
with a group of people, you know, for the for artists to lead in the creation of digital murals, which might be more accessible to some people who for many reasons can't leave their home spaces. Um, you know, so thinking about new ways of creating art is, is an important part of this. Um, one thing that I think about is in relationship to mural arts is the use of QR codes and how QR codes could um, build ways for non-visual folks to experience art um, through um, making audio description available to people through a QR code. That audio description does not have to be a literal description of an image. It could be the artist interpreting or the group of people who came together to create the work, interpreting the meaning of the work. Um, it could have different channels so that you have a child of eight talking about what they see, so that you have, you know, sort of um, someone like me talking about what I see, um, the artists and the makers talk, talking about um, what, what the work means to them. Um, so critical access does not offer straightforward solutions to access, that's not its intention. It understands access instead as a kind of ongoing political commitment to creating cultures of desirability that welcome and center disabled people. So crip cultural practices are not about assimilating disabled people into um, culture um, as it's already doing itself or making itself. It is about rerouting, in other words, um, changing the course of and also rerouting in the sense of putting different kinds of roots or different kinds of understandings of culture um, to presence uh, disabled and non-normative experience and to center it. Um, and there's lots, there's lots of ways of doing that. And, um, and I think that crip artists and disability identified artists and non-normative artists are at the cutting edge of teaching us how we can reroute and reroute our um, entire social life and can transform our workplaces in a much larger sense. So can also help us rethink the terms of our being together in, in a larger sense, in all kinds of social and cultural spaces, um, not only art spaces and not only within this small community of, of you know, sort of dis the disability arts movement or disability arts practice. Um, and, um, you know, I just wanna draw your attention to the work of two disabled artists who are at the cutting edge of critical access, and one is Carmen Papelia, who writes about open access as a method for putting critical access into action. He argues that every, everybody has a body of knowledge and is expert in their own experience, and he approaches open access as an assemblage, in other words, as something that co is co-designed by people and he's, who he says will be in the room, so the people you're imagining, the people who might be in the room, the people who have been in the room in the past and the people who haven't been in the room in the past. So who has been excluded historically, um, either through law or through practice? And how do we hope to in, in, invite those people to come into the room? Um, and so access emerges as relationship in Papilia's work. And it also emerges as relationship in the work of a uh, dis uh, disabled artist activist by the name of uh, Mia Mingus. And um, Mingus talks about access intimacy, which she describes as not just helping people, which can make people feel bad because it's premised on a kind of charity relationship and a kind of missionary relationship. But she says that, um, Access intimacy is, is that elusive, and I'm using her words, hard to describe feeling when somebody gets your access needs. So like other forms of intimacy, she argues that access intimacy can't be forced, but we can create the conditions for access intimacies to occur by fostering cultures of desirability in the spaces that we co-construct. So I'm gonna stop there and give space for um, Danielle. End of thought.
Thank you, Carla. Like, yeah, just so many things, like words that were coming to mind were denial by design, um, whether intentional or, or, or not, um, you know, for sure. Uh, some things that just need to start happening, uh, conversations, conversations. There is a wealth of knowledge and passion out there. Um, disability arts is not new. It's not something that just sort of popped out of the pandemic. Um, and I know that COVID has sort of, you know, put a spotlight in a lot of ways on, um, on, on, on accessibility in some ways, but um, it's something that I hope to, uh, continues on afterwards because these are conversations that need to continue on and need to keep happening. We need to be creating and reshaping the climates that we, you know, we want artists to work within. Um, we need to open that up. Uh, there, I'd love to see more dedicated calls, um, specifically to disabled artists. Um, and mad, deaf, and disabled identified artists, or just, you know, or how people identify. Uh, I think that would be something really, really great, especially with uh, the year of public art coming up um, and sort of being present in that. And I, and I think that a lot of um, institutions uh, now are sort of turning a lot of milestones, uh, 10 years, 20 years. I think that, I think we are primed, we are ready to have those conversations and, and connect with those people who have been doing really, really wonderful work for a, a long time now. And I, and I think it's time to, to have that bridging um, occur. And just also on terms of, um, we're throwing around the word institutions a lot and just um, just want to just put out there like, you know, to what, um, to what ends or problems do certain institutions actually solve? And when do we decide that, you know, XYZ institution was the only way to solve them and that, sort of expanding that scope and expanding that networking of support and, and who we bring into the conversation and how we might go about collectively, um, you know, doing acts of, of public art and, and that community work, um, you know, it's, it's something that we, we can expand on, on that. Um, you know, this isn't a conversation to be had just with certain institutions or certain organizations. It's kind of a, a conversation that we are all actively a part of. And this is for sure always in process. And I know for myself, always learning, always, always expanding. Um, you know, access is not something where you just tick a box off, you know, X, you know, you got this, that, and the other, and okay, you're done. You can sort of wipe your hands of it. Um, it's an ongoing process. Really, really funny story quickly. Uh, did a, a installation exhibit exhibit with the art spin uh, called the holding patterns exhibit and part of it had uh, these corn stalks in 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 as part of the exhibit and there was one person who was allergic to corn of all things right and so just just as a funny a funny story just you know goes to show that you know there's it is always in process we're always improving there's always more that we can do um, and there's there's no sort of end to that but there's a beauty in that and there's a hope in that embedded in that, um, that, you know, there's so much potential and, and, and so much opportunity there. And I just think it's, it's great for both art and community um, that there is so much to be done and there is so many conversations to, to be had. And, and it's something that we should be embracing. I think it's a really, really beautiful opportunity. There are people here who have so many wonderful stories to share and that, um, uh, you know, they, their bodies and their minds, like they're, they're here for a reason. And it's time we, we listened and it's time we, we heard those stories and we supported those stories in, in any way that, that we can. And I, and I just think there's a really beautiful opportunity in that. And I'm eager and I'm hopeful to, to see uh, more. And I'm definitely um, as disabled artist, indigenous artist myself, 100% I'm, I'm there to support and work with whoever, you know, just hit me up or, or you know, like, let's do something. Like, like let, let's just start. Um, and yeah, and just a quick note on just, you know, the different, just something that came to mind, just listening to you, Carla, you know, when I think of, uh, I think of inclusion, I think it's, I think of colonial. And when I think of access for me, that's, that's, that's indigenous, that's holistic, that's, that's whole being. Because if it's inclusion, you're just including it within that containment that exists. 
when it's access, you're talking about those invitations and you're talking about those conversations and bringing everybody into that. And I think, I think it's time for that. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, really appreciate a lot of points that were brought up. Um, in particular, you know, as you were all talking, I, I was like, oh, I wish there was time for one more question. Um, and then I was like, oh, maybe I'll just say it as a statement. But I think you all said it that really, it's not just like disabled artists that, you know, need access to mural arts and, and to like the wider arts communities, but like these arts communities really need disabled artists. Like we have so much genius and like knowledge um, and experience and skill to offer. Um, and I'm, I'm really, really glad that we, that we got to touch on that. Um, we are almost at time. Uh, I think we'll do a very quick Q and A. Um, Marta, how does that sound? Yeah, sounds good. We have two questions um, already. So maybe we can start with those. Thank you all for sharing so much today. This has, this has been really amazing and we still have a couple more questions here uh, for the panel. Um, okay, let's, let's get, in, get, get into it right away. <laughs> okay. um, do artists with disabilities feel they need to express or explain their disabilities effect in their artwork? Feel like that question is sort of drifting towards me. Everyone's like nodding. Um, do we do we feel or you know? It really depends on the individual. It depends on how they they identify. I think the problem um, should be there. It shouldn't be an expectation. Um, I I reflect on you know Dylan Robinson this idea of hungry listening and just sort of this idea of consuming uh, disabled bodies and consuming trauma. Um, and I, I think that's, that's getting away from, um, you know, the, 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 the work and, um, really, really detracting from, uh, what a lot of artists are, are, are trying to do and the conversations that they're, they're trying to have. Sometimes it is, uh, for me, uh, I do, sometimes I do performance work where I actually perform OCD and with with the artwork and then I actually have open conversations with people and because it's such a misunderstood reality that um, there's just so much opportunity and I've had some really really wonderful experiences with people do I justify or necessarily feel like I have to explain it absolutely not um, you know I, I am who I am if you're not going to sort of uh, accept me I'm sort of um, come to that place where I don't have time for that so I'll be you know I'm, I'm good, I'll, I, will, I will move on. We're not here necessarily, we can respect and honor each other, but we don't have to love everybody. Um, we are limited beings with limited time and energy. And so, uh, you know, not always, not always. And it's not something that I think should be expected. Um, it, if, if it's part of the work and if it comes from a good place from within, from, from the artists and, and, and it, it's clear that there's that, sort of connection there and, and there's that invitation to have that conversation, you know, that's great, but um, it's it shouldn't be uh, a necessity, I think. I'm gonna maybe jump in and add to that and build on what Danielle is saying by suggesting or, you know, arguing in the history of the white West, disabled bodies have been either put on display or hidden away and, um, you know, so either on the stage as a spectacle or hidden from public view, leading many disabled people to be subject to the stare still, as Rosemary Garland Thompson, who's a cultural studies scholar, talks about the stare. I think this makes um, claiming disability fraught and risky, especially for artists who are producing visual work or who are involved in performance kind of genres. Um, and there's always a risk that a person's work is going to be forever read or understood through these kind of power infused optics. I think that claiming disability becomes even more complicated for racialized folks and disabled folks who are not only or may not only be subject to the stare if they come out as disabled or if disability can be read on their bodies and through their bodies. Um, I, you know, we also have to think about the colonial gaze and a history in which uh, racialized people and um, 
indigenous people have been um, rendered as defective in the history of Western thought and scholarship and through the camera um, as um, you know, sort of primitive and other relative to the kind of white Western masculinist property subject who's seen as synonymous with kind of the ideal or the standard for the human species. Um, so this creates a, a really difficult double bind for people. Um, and at the same time, I think that there are some openings. And one opening might be Darlene Manning, who's an Anishinaabe artist scholar, has taught me that um, in Anishinaabe traditions, um, just uh, lacked a kind of deficit framing of mind-body difference that we've inherited from Western culture. So that which Western culture calls disability was understood differently within Anishinaabe uh, philosophy and Anishinaabe worldviews. So that opens up the possibility of art becoming a space where those different understandings emerge and can be explored. And I would say similarly in the work of people like um, Cyrus Marcus Ware, um, who um, is a black trans artist who looks to black speculative fiction to reconceive mind body difference as kind of emerging and morphing in a dynamic reality marked by kind of continuous change. So these visions of reality as kind of relational and as dynamic, whether they're coming from Anishinaabe traditions or black speculative fiction, I think open up new possibilities for imagining mind-body difference, for recuperating what was before the colonial period and before contact and enslavement, and for imagining possibilities otherwise that um, you know sort of open up um, opportunities for us to think about what other kinds of counter futures can we imagine? Um, end of thought. Bushra, you're muted. Yeah, I was just gonna add about, uh, you know, everything that, <laughs> that Carla and Danielle have said is uh, brilliant. Uh, I also wanted to, to talk about uh, the pressures around representation, you know, that, that come up where people feel like, oh, you know, do I have to represent you know, all disabled people in this work that I'm doing and, you know, how, how people navigate that. But I would say uh, all, always giving people choice, you know, because there are, you know, there are those who are proudly politically um, claim disability, right? As part of their identity and as part of their practice. And so, um, and also considering about who, whose lens is on the work that you're doing. So for, for, from a funding perspective, you know, um, disability project uh, programs being peer assessed by other people who with lived experience of disability across the first spectrum versus having your work seen by non-disabled folks or non-disabled identifying folks, right? So um, I don't think that there's an expectation that people work represent their disability or that they speak about their disability, but that they, um, or that they disclose a disability, but that if it's important to the work that you're doing, um, that you may think about the ways in which you want to share and how much you want to share with your peers. That's, that's what I wanted to add. Great, thank you all for that. Mm. Um, should we get into one more question? I only have one more, so maybe we should get into that. <laughs> yes, I also wanted to put into the, uh, I put, did put in the chat a link to Art Fix Snippasing, which is a group yes in uh, North Bay that works with uh, folks with mental health and addictions. And has um, I wanted to share about an upcoming mural project that they're gonna be mounting in a mall very soon. And I didn't get to talk about that, so I just wanted to <laughs> put that out there. I've been yeah. gathering, uh, I've been gathering all the links that have been shared. Okay, perfect. Put them in a, in a resource doc. Great, thank you. Okay, so in the last couple of minutes that we have, how do artists who are marginalized by systems gain opportunities to display their work in prominent places? Many are currently presenting at the margins. What incentives are needed for organizations to bring marginalized people into the forefront? Uh, I can speak from my position in saying that um, scholars out there and um, uh, journalists 
need to write about this work. And that is one way of um, bringing attention to it. Um, you know, so that scholars have a, an important role to play in this. And I think that artists as well, but artists and scholars also need um, to be brought into disability arts theory and practice, and we need to build the field. Um, and and um, journalists, I think, need to have, um, what would you call it, maybe the word literacy might work here, um, in terms of their understanding of disability arts and culture and non-normative arts and culture. So um, they might need some training and mentoring also to be able to write in, in the field. End of thought. Bushra, Danielle, you want to add to that? Um, just offering the space. Bushra? <laughs> uh, you go ahead, Danielle, and I'm just sort of gathering my thoughts, so. Okay. Um, I, yeah, there's sort of like twofold uh, things to sort of, um, that come up for that question is, um, uh, can we expand the margins is, mm. is something that comes to mind for me. Um, you know, established, recognized, you know, um, the institutions or galleries and things like that, that sort of, oh, that's actually making it. That's actually, you know, doing something. And it's, and if those places are exclusionary places, I question to who do they serve? Like what, to, to what parts of the community do they serve? And then what does it mean to have your work in those places that don't serve the communities that you're looking to support or that need support or that you're coming from and things like that. So a lot of questions come to mind and, and the word sort of that floats in my head is sort of meritocracy. And this idea of, you know, who, again, who, when did we decide, uh, you know, what institutions um, have merit? and you know are worthwhile and and what margins are not maybe the issue is that we have margins to begin with and can we challenge that and maybe that's where the resources should go not necessarily a question of how do we incentivize how do we invite how to how to get just as an example the ago to bring in more disabled artists but how can we support those margins so that those disabled artists can support themselves and build their community themselves and envision that and become something and an anchor point for other people in the community and actually represent the voices and the stories and the bodies that are actually living there in those spaces rather than necessarily thinking about how we can give those other already established places um, more time and more money and more voice because I think that there is a tendency to de default uh, um, the conversation to certain dominant voices and I think that might be part of the problem is that we are always coming back to those dominant voices and we are missing those voices that we are silencing erasing or you know or just sort of um, aren't giving that that time and that support so I wonder if maybe we could just sort of flip that, flip the tables on that question a little bit. That's something that um, sort of comes to mind for me. And I think that's excellent. Um, yeah, definitely to support <laughs> to support the emer the disability deaf and disability disabled infrastructure that there that is there. Like support those organizations. You know the art fix the things and the you know the. Tangled Art and Disability, the Workman Arts, all of these organizations like support uh, those that are there uh, that are led by, run by folks with lived experience um, to be able to do to bet to do this work while at the same time putting pressure on the main those main screen spaces to open up, both by bringing people inside and by you know the work what they what they what they um, uh, present. Just want to add quickly to, I kind of have a bit of an issue with the idea of incentivizing it too. I don't necessarily think we should have to incentivize um, making sure voices and bodies are recognized and heard and that, you know, people are being recognized as human beings and access to housing and wellness. Those are fundamental human rights. Having to incentivize those, I, I question personally the, you know, that. Just want to add that quickly. 
Mm. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thanks, Danielle. Uh, YJ, any final words? Uh, no? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> just just a, a big, big, big thank you to Mural Arts and to our panelists, Bushra, Carla, Danielle, for, for sharing so much and so eloquently today. Um, I feel really, really honored um, and lucky to be here. Thank you. For, thank you for inviting us. I was going to say, likewise, uh, it's been truly a pleasure. Carla, Bushra, Danielle, YJ, thank you all for being with us today here. Like this has been really, really, really amazing conversation. I did not expect otherwise, but, um, you know, like uh, living up to the expectations, which is which is great. Um, yeah, I just want to, um, yeah, thank you and just uh, let our participants know that the final session takes place today at 5 p.m. And with that, we'll be wrapping up the symposium. It's actually a project presentation um, from a project that took place in Vancouver uh, earlier this year. So um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day um, and hopefully we'll see you at five. Thank you Thank so much you. again, our panelists and uh, YJ. Thank you.